Okay, um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Keith uh, Brewis. He, he is from uh, Grimshaw uh, Associates. Uh, just maybe uh, um, uh, whilst I think Professor Kim is going to give the introduction, I'll just say a couple of words, <laughs> if I may. I mean, um, for, for those of you who don't know, I'm from, from Farrell's, and Grimshaw and Farrell's have some history, and uh, actually. Um, uh, we're working together at some stage, and it was really interesting to see uh, what uh, the path of the different architects were, and I was uh, always very excited to see uh, Grimshaw's work and how they um, actually, I, in my view, have, uh, have quite similar, have retained quite similar um, uh, objectives for what they're trying to achieve with their architecture. So I'm very much looking forward to Keith uh, talking about that. Um, Kim, could you, uh, uh, Professor Kim, could you? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Bruce. Keith Bruce is a managing partner of uh, Grimshaw, also uh, Australian business. His range of award-winning projects include the uh, Foundation, Kaisha Art Gallery in Spain, and the Southern Cross Station in Melbourne. Keith's pr primary work explored the uh, master planning of uh, building systems and in Ecologies, most recently with the uh, Eagle Street redevelopment in Brisbane, Brisbane Airport. Keith lectures ex ex extensively in Asia, UK, and Australia. Uh, please welcome to uh, Keith Bruce. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here, and thank you, Stefan, for reminding us of the Farrell Grimshaw days. Um, I think uh, for those who know both Farrell and Grimshaw, um, I think we're both very practical uh, architects um, and therefore it's a little bit unusual that I'm here to speak more of a theory, uh, I suppose in terms of uh, my own view um, of uh, high-rise buildings and where they sit within uh, the emerging uh, booming urbanity. Um, I think uh, we're at a point where the world is a very confused place. Um, I think um, certainly within the development of urbanity and the development of tall buildings that there is uh, superb uh, technology, superb skills available to us, uh, computational engineering, uh, all of the various uh, engineering technologies, um, the whole promotion uh, of urbanism, the densification, the move from rural economies, uh, into city ones, um, and I think wealth. Um, society is seeing greater levels of wealth um, than ever before, even with the, uh, the GFC. Um, and I think all of that tends to lead us to think that uh, there is a certain iconic uh, model for our cities. Um, but I think tinged with that, or working um, against it, is also this uh, real understanding that we're living in a, uh, in a, in a carbon conscious era. Um, ever since uh, the mid-19th century uh, with the industrial age. Um, I think we've exploited uh, fossil fuels uh, without really very much consideration at all. So we've become lazy. Uh, we've become lazy as people. Uh, and we've lost, I think, our ingenuity. Um, and I think what has resulted is that the city uh, has become, albeit a very efficient place, it's become an anxious place um, where the pursuit of urbanity um, has actually started to lead to uh, urbanity forgetting about what it needs to support itself, which is the rural economy. And that actually humanity um, looks to ruralism and looks to nature um, for its health, for its well-being, um, for its feeling of place. And I, I would uh, applaud a recent book by Richard Louvre uh, called um, uh, Last Child in the Woods, which really is uh, starting to suggest that uh, humans are starting, humans within cities are starting to uh, suffer from a nature deficit uh, disorder, and that actually people don't understand anymore uh, where all of the things that cities need actually come from, including things as straightforward as milk. In terms of uh, high-rise, um, it's a, it, you can plot uh, many, many paths, um, I think, in terms of the development of high-rise since uh, 
the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, clearly, we moved from a masonry, uh, a masonry structure into uh, steel-based structures, um, higher technology with glazing. I think, uh, in a way, the, the most simplistic forms of high-rise were emerging in the early 1970s, uh, particularly the American model, where uh, there was very little contemplation of energy use uh, and carbon uh, emission. Um, buildings have certainly become more uh, technically advanced, uh, the development of skins uh, of buildings, contemplation of insulation. Um, but with that, there's also been uh, development of uh, lifting technologies and vertical transportation. And all of this has started to trend uh, the high-rise model um, to a very, very efficient model that has probably plateaued uh, in terms of its pure efficiency. I think what has also probably plateaued um, is, is the... Uh, is the kind of search for icon. I think the search for pure identity without the contemplation of where that identity, how that identi identity fits in its, uh, in its particular place. Um, and therefore, a very simplistic model that uh, we've drawn out is really to say that if you just take one of the metrics of high-rise buildings, such as net to gross, you can see that net, net to gross has improved uh, over time um, as technology has gained uh, pace. Um, as I said, I think that probably plateaued somewhere uh, in the uh, 90s. Um, and what is now happening is that as the wall thicknesses of buildings are getting uh, wider, that actually net to gross is starting to uh, diminish. But with that, lifting technologies uh, combat that. Turning back to uh, Stefan's introduction, I do think it's uh, quite remarkable that I represent um, Grimshaw Architects. I think we have a reputation... Uh, in, in terms of really understanding where buildings come from, uh, in terms of their engineering attribute uh, and the way that they're built. Um, and because of that, we build a huge amount of uh, infrastructure uh, within our portfolio. But the company actually uh, hasn't built many uh, recognized uh, or accomplished high-rise buildings. And it, 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 I started to question the reason for that. And that is really, I suppose, part of what this, uh, this talk is about. Um, but we are, I think, certainly skilled in um, matters of engineering and matters of urbanity. Um, and actually, really, a, a, I suppose, a testament to this degree of difficulty that the company faces and, and maybe its anxiety to do with the impact of uh, high-rise into urbanity. Um, a particular model of mine, uh, I, I was asked to do a competition in, uh, in Dubai uh, a few years ago where they were looking for two very large, very tall twin towers. And actually, uh, the proposal that we came up with was a low-rise uh, building. And it was a low-rise building, I think, because... And it, it sort of challenged the brief, because it was really contemplating the effect of high-rise, the appropriateness of high-rise within that very harsh climate, um, and the effect of high-rise uh, on, on humanity and the, the social effect. So it actually started to manage uh, social places uh, and social spaces into human-scaled uh, element rather than going straight to the icon uh, high rise. And I think that's been further exemplified with a recent submission we made for a SciTech project uh, in Beijing. Um, again, where our pursuit has been about the integration of different uses uh, and appreciation of the consumption uh, and wastage of a project uh, and really trying to celebrate, I suppose, uh, humanity in human space rather than simply uh, immediately suggesting that the higher the better. Um, so these are some of the images of the SciTech project uh, integration, integration in terms of uh, waste, green space, uh, many different uses uh, within the particular facility. Um, and I think the, uh, the practices portfolio is really um, defined by what we term performative architecture. Uh, it's an architecture where there's a real appreciation about how the building works, uh, where it comes from, what it relies upon. And it's that appreciation that gives it the spirit um, so this, uh, this uh, pavilion for the 1992 Seville Expo, which won uh, the Environmental Award, the European Environmental Award uh, during that year, starts to suggest that buildings need to work far harder uh, into their place uh, and into their climate, but in doing so, that they define their own identity. Um, I think certainly to do with urbanity and certainly to do with high-rise buildings, uh, a whole host of uh, inputs need to be contemplated. And I think the, uh, the building typology, because of its scale, deserves uh, a far greater um, set of design inputs uh, before the particular outcome is reached, uh, including the various things uh, on, on the screen. 
So we, I example some of these inputs uh, with some of our portfolio and some of our thinking, but I think all of this uh, relates into the engagement and the connection between urbanity uh, and the rural uh, economy. With our Eden project, uh, our, our main pursuit was really to contemplate embodied energy. Uh, we, st we really strove to minimize uh, materiality, the consumption uh, of the material use uh, of the project. And we showed through very efficient skin technology uh, and structural technology that we could reduce the embodied energy of this building, which is a, a vast uh, plant enclosure, to 10%, so 10 times less than a traditional uh, glass and steel structure. And this was really about working in a very parsimonious, a very frugal way, uh, working and learning from nature. Uh, and that thinking has pushed us on uh, a series of Earth Park projects which are starting to emerge uh, internationally where we are really contemplating the way that uh, urban places uh, and urban buildings need to think about uh, their cooling loads uh, and cooling themselves uh, naturally rather than through active um, carbon fueled uh, methods. The emerging proposal, Daniel Liebeskind uh, was speaking earlier on about um, the, the uh, Nine Zero site, the, um, the World Trade Center, the formal, formal World Trade Center site. Grimshaw are currently doing the uh, interchange at Fulton Street, um, just along from there. And again, the whole pursuit of this project is to think that uh, all of every place that humans uh, are within the cities need, need to be humanized, and the craving uh, within high-rise cities is for natural daylight. Um, so Fulton Street, which works to connect a whole series of subways below ground, uh, the whole proposition, uh, which is currently in construction, is that there is an oculus which tracks the sun uh, through all uh, seasons and focuses uh, natural daylight uh, deep into the inhabited uh, places below the ground uh, for the transport interchange. We're also, as a company, uh, sinking our own capital uh, money into energy-related research and development projects, such as this one, which is a, a, um, a vertical access uh, rotor um, for offshore uh, energy consumption. Um, and the project that was mentioned in the introduction, Southern Cross Station in Melbourne, again, the, the government in Melbourne uh, looked for an urban uh, response, it looked for a transport response, um, but it actually wanted an air-conditioned box. It wanted something that, over its lifetime, would uh, use up uh, a vast amount of energy. Um, instead of that, we persuaded them that a naturally ventilated uh, place, which really sought to maximize uh, the thermal stack effect uh, and to accelerate wind passage over the roof, uh, could acti actively um, ventilate uh, a large uh, city uh, building such as Southern Cross Station, and through that it would seek its identity. And buildings that we have looked at, high-rise that we have looked at, have certainly uh, been performance-driven. They contemplate uh, their shadowing, they contemplate uh, the wind effect, and they try and uh, distort, I suppose, the uh, lateral and vertical forces uh, into sinuous um, plant-like uh, forces. I think one of the, uh, the major concerns uh, of humanity over the course of the next few decades will be its uh, search for water. And I think high-rise and urbanity needs to contemplate that. Again, we have practiced into, um, into reverse osmosis uh, desalination plants, but we also have looked at um, projects which try uh, within their urban setting to propose uh, passive desalination and the creation of potable drinking water uh, as part of the urban environment. Uh, such as this project um, within Las Palmas uh, in the Canary Islands off uh, the west coast of Africa. Um, we're also proposing that uh, buildings store their own water. They use the water for their thermal mass. Uh, they, collect it, they collect the water they've used, uh, they filter it, um, and they can either recreate potable water or use water for um, irrigation or grey water uh, for flushing, such as uh, Desero's uh, office in, in Mexico. And I think there's also a re recreational uh, aspect to that as well. This, uh, this is, full, this is um, the Croton uh, water treatment plant uh, for New York. It's, uh, it's where all of the water that comes in from Manhattan uh, is stored. Um, what we're also trying to do is to put this huge tank below ground, but for it to be a demonstration project uh, where all of the storm water, all of the, the water uh, landing on the site uh, is reused either for... Uh, grey water function uh, for, rec um, for irrigation or for recreation, uh, such as the golf course 
that appears above it. And then I think my uh, particular uh, fascination at the moment, albeit it's not a pleasant fascination, is to do with waste. And I think uh, more than anything, cities need to start to think about not wasting waste. Um, we as a company are becoming more and more uh, encouraged to start to deal uh, and practice into um, energy from waste projects. There's a whole series of emerging uh, sort of mini power stations uh, within the urban setting uh, throughout Europe, which I find really uh, interesting. Um, we've also, uh, as, an, as a research and development project, looked at uh, the idea that organic waste produced by cities can be pushed into large biodigesters, and the biodigesters themselves can create methane to burn for power, can create heat directly um, through that uh, process, uh, and also to create uh, compost for um, inner city agriculture. But I think the key is to actually start to contemplate how cities uh, consume less and how they waste less. Um, and again, a project that I was looking at uh, within Brisbane uh, tried to set or tie a whole series of energy uh, and waste loops together into a series of closed loop systems um, where each building isn't thought about in isolation. Every building and every part of the infrastructure of an emerging city should be thought about as part of a system. Uh, and all of those systems should be thought about in terms of the way they can connect, uh, what they use, what one, the wastage of one building can be the fuel of another. And actually through a, a series of kind of alchemy, uh, a, a, a process of alchemy that you can constantly uh, improve uh, the, the, the lessening, or you can certainly lessen uh, the amount of waste that a, a city produces, uh, holding on to the waste as a fuel uh, for other benefits within that place. For green, we could talk about nature, uh, and this jumps back to that original book um, that I mentioned by Richard Louvre, um, where I think cities crave nature. Now, this is a, it's clearly it's an artificial nature, it's a manufactured nature, but I think we need to do this on uh, a grand scale rather than a tokenistic scale. Um, the Eden Project, whilst it's in a rural setting, I think it gives, it clues, it gives us clues to uh, centralised um, urban nature, uh, nature used for recreation, nature used potentially for agriculture. Um, and our Earth Park projects are certainly coexisting or coinciding nature uh, deep into the heart of uh, any emerging uh, major buildings, such as this uh, proposal for uh, Qatar, Doha. And a project that is recently uh, coming to uh, its conclusion is uh, a project called Via Verde uh, in um, the Bronx uh, in in uh, New York City, where there is a complete uh, interlap and an interweave uh, between nature, uh, the various outputs of humanity, uh, and the demands, I suppose, of living, where green spaces, both for recreation, uh, for relaxation, and for agriculture, coexist within a very dense uh, urban fabric, and a very harsh urban fabric, uh, such as the Bronx. Clearly, we can push nature into basic commercial buildings. And again, another project that I looked at in Brisbane, again, uh, sought, I suppose, for the whole uh, identity of the project to contemplate the breakout spaces and the natural spaces uh, of a mixed-use tower rather than just simply about the technical uh, or engineering uh, achievements um, of that tower. And finally, uh, I think social spaces are uh, vital. I think social spaces within the tower uh, and within the tower model uh, are, are really key, where I think towers need to be broken down into places that people can appreciate, that there are human scales, such as this proposal uh, of ours for Dubai, uh, a further proposal in Morocco, um, where places are actually humanized, uh, and they, they're appreciated, and they, uh, they tie into uh, more standard uh, scales of space. Um, clearly, how, um, high rise and density um, go together, as uh, previous speakers have mentioned. Uh, for example, work, and certainly uh, the work of Farrell uh, picks up on this throughout Asia, where really we have to contemplate, I think, the connection between high, dense, high density and, uh, and transport. Um, I do find it very interesting that a sprawling city like Melbourne, uh, and the work of Rob Adams, a great uh, urban planner, has really uh, turned its back on high-rise as its solution and just says that it needs linear density uh, along all of its major transport corridors to turn the city from 3.5 million people 
uh, currently into 7 million people um, in 2050. So it isn't following that high-rise, the traditional high-rise model, but, isn't, but it's really following the mid-rise, the uh, 7 to 10-storey uh, building for its uh, proposal. And to conclude, I suppose, my, uh, my belief is that buildings can't simply look after, they can't just simply follow that original simplistic uh, use, one, one use uh, for any particular building. They have to be far more complex than that. They have to move away from this model uh, into a model that deals with many uses, uh, many inputs, uh, a model that can be adapted uh, over time, um, that can create natural uh, buffer spaces, uh, that there can actually be uh, opportunities to adapt existing buildings uh, through the creation of new places bolted onto the outside of them. And that we move away from this model, this is one of our tall buildings for the City of London, uh, and actually what will start to be driven, what will start, to, I think, to emerge is a diminishing of uh, the standard net to gross and probably the diminishing of land value because I think each building, each major building, uh, needs to do far more uh, within its social uh, context. And I think what we should do in, in terms of judging a building in terms of its icon is actually to judge it on the happiness uh, and the health of its occupants rather than necessarily than simply its, uh, its immediate, its immediate uh, visual impact. And I think uh, icons should in fact uh, earn that reputation over time rather than simply um, expect to create them instantly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Keith, for, for this very insightful um, um, uh, uh, talk about uh, performance-based architecture and how uh, environmental consideration can be a much more holistic approach rather than just um, uh, added on uh, features uh, to, to our buildings, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, you know, energy, nature, waste, all these things Keith has mentioned. I thought it was very interesting. Um, moving on to our last...